The first was time sharing, which was being advocated very hard at the beginning of the decade. The key thing that was being observed was that there was a lot better way to interact with a computer. The second major idea, though, of the last decade had been the notion that computer networks were not only needed but were valuable, and they are gradually coming into fruition. The computer technology has been moving in a way that nothing else people have ever known has moved. Here is a field that gets a thousand times as good in 20 years. The communication field hasn't been able to keep pace, but the melding of computers and communication and the switch to digital communication technology, aided and abetted by satellites, is, going, is doing something pretty good for communication. The problem is once the concept of that network would have to embody the efficient utilization of communication resources, as well as to provide a system which was both reliable, error-free, and provide the high bandwidth needed for interactive use of those resources. This means that users sitting at a terminal would be able to hit a key and see a response virtually instantly, almost as if that computer, wherever it were, uh, looked like it was in the same room. A simple way to interconnect computers and, and to form such a network is to place wideband least circuits, in the case of the ARPANET 50 kilobit per second circuits, between each of the computers and then to interconnect each of the computers to each other to form a fully connected network. As more sites come onto the network, uh, the requirement is then to connect that site to every other one, which means that the extension of the network is just not a graceful thing. And so this naturally leads to the concept of a store and forward technique in order to cut down on the expense of building such a network. And so let's erase these lines over here to leave ourselves for the moment with a loop network which can be extended. And in this type of network, this computer, for example, would talk to this computer not by sending in a message directly since there is no circuit, but sending a message first to this computer which would then store it and forward it onto this computer, thereby acting as a relay. In order to have a reliable network of this sort, each of the individual computers must be sufficiently reliable to maintain the kind of communications that's needed. But unfortunately, most computer installations are just not reliable enough, and this leads to the notion of a small mini processor to take on the functions of the computers and to allow a single design to then be propagated among all the installations so that we would put a little mini processor at each computer, like that, disconnect the 50 kilobit circuits linking the computers themselves, and then interconnect these little mini processors, or imps, with the wideband circuits, and interconnect the computers to the imps in this fashion. Now, such a network would then operate essentially in the same fashion as the previous one with this computer talking to this computer by first sending a message to its imp, having this imp relay it to this imp, and this imp relay it to this imp, and then this imp deliver it to the final destination. Now, this kind of a network can be made to be extremely reliable since an effective control can be placed upon the design of each of these imps since there is no large political problem in getting a large number of sites to cooperate in the design and building of the communications part of the system. We operate a network control center here at BBN Cambridge, uh, and each imp, uh, every half second, sends us a little message telling us how it feels and how each of its lines are and how each of its hosts are and what kind of loading it's got. And we man that center 24 hours a day uh, and we use those status reports uh, from the imps to generate statistics about network performance and also to alert the operators to any immediate needs for maintenance, either in circuits or in imps. Here is an instance of the ARPANET as it was recently configured, as you can see, with some 25 or 30 sites in it. The transmission of a message, say, from a node over here to a node over here might go as follows. The computer at this point would send a message into its local imp, which would break it down into thousand-bit packets. The packets would then be transmitted from imp to imp 
along a route selected by the imps themselves. At the destination imp, the packets would be reassembled in the proper order and delivered to the computer. And then a message would go back along perhaps a different route to indicate that the original message was received. The whole transmission cycle typically takes no more than a few tenths of a second. The system is completely independent of the ups and downs of small numbers of lines. For example, if this circuit over here broke in the midst of the transmission, the message had gotten that far, it might then backtrack or back here and possibly take some other route until it gets to the destination. There is error checking in between each amp, so that in the transmission from this node to this node, uh, the message that was sent would actually be error checked and an acknowledgement would be sent back. And then from here to here, it would be error checked. And if it got correct, correctly accepted, a, an acknowledgement would go back and so forth along each set of imps along the path. A very it's been hard to uh, share information for years. The printing press, of course, was the great step into sharing information, but the printing press didn't essentially handle the problem of distributing it. It handled the problem of copying it. And we have been needing for a long time some better way to distribute information than to carry it about. The print on paper form is uh, embarrassing because in order to distribute it, you've got to move the paper around. And lots of paper gets to be bulky and heavy and expensive to move about. There are 90 million checking accounts in the United States. These are in some 13,000 banks. And on the average, there's a check written on each one of these accounts every business day. About 100 million checks every business day. And that's 100 million pieces of paper. If we get into a, a mode in which everything is handled electronically and your only identification is some little plastic thing you stick into the machinery, then I can imagine that they want to get that settled up with your bank account just right now and put it through all the checks. And that would require a network. And uh, we have our own network, which links the Federal Reserve offices, there are 37 of them, and they in turn are linked with commercial banks in their communities. That linkage is not yet complete. The kind of communication required is exactly that provided by a computer communications network. The kind of communication in which you can get in for a tenth of a second or for a hundredth of a second or a thousandth of a second, do your job and be over with it and let somebody else use the facilities. There is some resistance to changes in people's money habits. Many people like to get currency. They like the feel of it. Other people don't like to have this mechanized and made a matter of record on a bank account because husbands want a wife to know, you know, what his income is. There isn't any real need to change things just for the sake of, of changing, but I tend to believe that things are going to be considerably better for a lot of people when and if we ever get changed over to an essentially electronic base. You know, it's just fundamental that if one wants to deal with information, he ought to deal with the information and not with the paper it's written on. The network now costs us uh, one-tenth the cost of mail for moving paper, and this cost will continually go down as labor costs go up, so that it's quite clear that uh, material will be moved and handled and stored in computer systems rather than in filing cabinets. Right now, it's possible to buy for about a million dollars an information store that will hold the equivalent of about a hundred thousand books. So one can store, one can buy the store for a book for about the same amount as he can buy the book. So that if everyone had a display console in his home and in his office, he could be reading from electronically stored information instead of from a book. And the difference is he could have access to anything he wanted to read instead of just what was in within reach. Well, it turns out to be surprisingly inexpensive if you get wideband transmission facilities to send the stuff right when it has to be read instead of sending it to a local bookstore or a local library in the hope that it might be read. But the network consists of a CRT display, a RAN tablet, 
and a single hardware button. The display has a line generator, character generator, short vector generator, and four levels of brightness control. The tablet work area is the brown 10 and a quarter by 10 and a quarter horizontal surface. The stylus has a micro switch in the tip, which when closed allows the transmission of stylus XY position data to the computer. The hardware button near the green light invokes the system sign-on display. Note that the stylus is handled much as a pencil or pen might be. The virtual stylus position is represented on the display by the point of light. The point follows the operator's hand motions as though attached directly to the stylus. When the pen is pressed lightly against the tablet, the pen switch closes and the system responds by providing an ink track on the display. When the pen is lifted, the track disappears. The operator's hand moves freely in two dimensions. Figures of random size and position may be drawn with exactly the motions used in drawing them with pencil on paper. The tight feedback and natural hand motions enhance the feeling of drawing on the display. When a symbol is drawn in an appropriate area, the system replaces the ink track by the corresponding stylized symbol. A group of virtual buttons is represented at the top of the display by the label areas. The system function is obtained by pushing on the corresponding area. We are about to press on the button marked File Editor. The File Editor controls graphic files. For instance, a file name may be dragged from one area to another. This sequence holds the name of a file temporarily while the file is destroyed. Then a copy of a second file. The details are in the form of an IBM assembler language text. We may scroll the text past the viewing area to position it at some interesting point. These three lines are apparently misplaced, so we may remove them and reinsert them correctly. The string RCENTR is incorrect. We erase the R and then the blank the text is automatically readjusted. The word should be centroid, so we indicate an insertion caret and print OID on the dotted line. Erasing the caret causes the OID to be inserted between the R and the parenthesis. Below, the characters comma R4 are no longer needed, so we erase them and also the resulting blanks. We may then decide to insert a blank line between two existing lines and add subtext. In this case, the expression add to R11 the contents of the cell BASE, base. The scroll may be returned to its original position, and we may ask for a data abstract. The data display may also be scrolled for positioning. The vertical lines of checks on the left, this list of processes takes us back to the topmost level, where we may start to edit the flow diagram. First we erase a flow arrow, then move the connector out of the way so that we may draw a box in its place. The printing in the box is being used as commentary only in this case. The box is slightly too large, so we may change its size. Then draw a flow from the connector to the box. Attach a decision element to the box and draw a flow from it to scan. We then erase the flow arrows attached to the process post new area and move the box to a new position. This allows us to draw a new box, then chop off its corner and label it subscan with a residual error.